So welcome to week two of The Ghost of our series. This is our Halloween series where we're talking about the Holy Spirit, right? We're talking about the Holy Ghost. Now, last week we talked about the presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I mentioned last week and I'll mention again this week is that sometimes when we think about God, the Holy Spirit's just a little weird for us. Because, you know, we, we think about God the Father, and we've all got a father, right? Even if, even if you didn't have a great father, even if, you know, your father was absent from your life, you've seen other people with, with good fathers, and, I mean, like, like you just, you understand the concept of father. That's God the Father. And then we think about Jesus, you know, God the Son, that, that part of the Trinity. And, again, you may not be a son, you may be a daughter, you may not have a son, you may have always wanted a son, or maybe you've got a son and you wish you didn't have one. I don't know, you know, where, wherever you are, but like that concept is very familiar. You get it, you understand it. It's easy to, to connect to, it's easy to grasp. But then you get to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and that's where things just start to kind of break down. It feels a little weird for us. And we describe the Holy Spirit and angels and demons and, and whatever, as the supernatural. And what I mentioned last week, if you, if you didn't make it last week for the very first week, what we talked about last week is back in the very beginning, in Genesis 1-1, it says that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and he was there in creation, and the Holy Spirit has been with us. He's been a part of this world, a part of this universe, a part of the natural since the very beginning. And in the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he talked with them. He communed with them. And what we would call the supernatural today was natural before the fall, was natural before sin entered the world, that there's something about this perception, the way that we can or cannot see the presence of God, experience the presence of God, the Holy Spirit is different today because of sin than it was for Adam and Eve back in the garden. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. But it's because of our sin that God has decided, however that works, and again, I'm not God, all right? I, I believe in a sovereign God, and I, I trust God. I trust the God of the Bible. I give, I've given my life completely to him. I can't completely explain this, but what I know to be true is that when we sinned, the part of us that died, remember, because God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that one forbidden fruit, you will have sinned and you will surely die. They didn't physically die. The, the physical part of them continued on, and eventually they died. We all die physically. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that we are spiritually dead. And because we are spiritually dead without the Holy Spirit in our lives, what I, what I don't understand is, is how it, it, and why exactly God just sort of turned that off. It's like there's, a, it's like there's one of our senses. You know, we, can, we can see, we can hear, we can taste, you know, we can feel things. But we had this spiritual sense where we could commune with God, talk to God one-on-one -on -one personally. Adam and Eve saw him, walked with him in the garden, and that ended with the fall. And so now we call what was natural in the beginning and what will one day be natural again, right? When Jesus comes back one day and we're all called up into heaven, the alive and the dead, the living and the dead, and God creates this, this, this new heaven and new earth, and everything is exactly the way that he designed it, or the way that he wants it to be without sin. In that day, we will be spiritual again, and we will have that sixth sense, whatever that is, where we see and we experience. But from time to time, even now, in the natural, God allows the supernatural to be experienced to sort of break through, so to speak. And we learned last week that uh, when Jesus went back up into heaven, he actually told his disciples, listen, it's better for me that I go. Because Jesus was here, he's the physical representation of God, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God among, among us. But because God took off his majesty, took off his glory, and took off some parts of his power to put on the sin, or not the sin, the skin of humanity, that automatically limited Jesus in a couple of ways. He couldn't be everywhere at all times, right? Because he, he, in his body, he became a, a, still an infinite being, but he was in one place with the disciples. So like the 12 that walked with him or the hundreds that followed him, you know, he, he wasn't like in that spot and on the other side of the world at the same time. Now, I guess he's God. He could have done that if he wanted to. But he purposefully limited himself for a limited amount of time as Jesus. And so what Jesus said to the disciples is, look, it's better for you that I go away, but I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to send someone else to you. It's the Holy Spirit. And that spiritual part of God 
is in you and will continue being in you, and he's going to give you power. There's, there's going to be some ways that you experience the Holy Spirit that you've never dreamed of, and that's what happened to the disciples. And for us today as Christians, if you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, the same Holy Spirit that was in the disciples 2,000 years ago is the same Holy Spirit that was at creation and through all of the Old Testament is the same Holy Spirit that dwells within you. You are the temple of God, and inside of the temple of God, there is that holy of holies, that, that presence of God. It is the Holy Spirit within you. So last week we asked the question, like, so why, why don't I feel that way, right? Why, why, don't, I, why don't we get it as Christians? Why, why aren't we living like we are actually filled with the Spirit? And there were two very quick reasons. One is some of us, we just don't know, right? So that's over with. Now we know, all right? We, we've gotten to the point that we know. We, we're, you may have not been aware that the Holy Spirit was in you before, but after last week and just now, if you weren't here last week, now you've heard it. Now you're aware the Holy Spirit is a part of your life, but then some of us, we just sort of ignore him. We go through our lives just ignoring the presence of the Holy Spirit. And maybe that's because we've never really experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this week, what I want to talk about, just spend a few minutes and make a few observations from Scripture. What I want to talk about this week is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say power. Power. So last week was the presence, this week is the power. Now, what I'm not going to talk about this week are the gifts of the Spirit, spiritual gifts, things like speaking in tongues or prophecy or healing or, or administration or preaching or teaching. I'm not going to talk about any of that. What I want to talk about this week is the power of the Holy Spirit that all of us, every Christian, can and should experience. Because spiritual gifts, those are individualized. We don't all have every gift of the Spirit. And we're going to talk about that next week. But this week, this is the power of the Holy Spirit for all of us. How many is all? If you're in the room, raise your hand. Okay, very good. Some of you don't have your hands up. Apparently, you're not here this morning. All right, that's okay. That's all right. Here's what I want to tell you. If you are a follower of Christ, and listen, if you're here this morning and you would just say, listen, I'm just trying to figure out this whole church thing. I'm not sure yet. Like, I've been listening, and I've got this friend who invited me or a family member or my mama made me come, whatever it is. If you're here this morning and you would not already identify as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you're just checking it out, trying to see what this is all about, you're welcome here. You are welcome to belong here and be a part of us as long as you want to be. It's a safe place. You can belong here before you believe everything that we believe, right? But what I want to tell you is what I'm about to talk about really is for the church. It is for those who are followers of Christ. There's, there's power here that I'm going to talk about this morning that there are, there are parts of it that might seem familiar whether you're a Christ follower or not. And you may even say, well, I, I've sort of felt that way, or maybe I've got a friend who's kind of identified that way. It's just a, a dim glimpse, just, just a, a sliver of what the Holy Spirit has made available to Christians of Christ followers. And the only way to have that, that full access to what we're going to talk about this morning is to trust Jesus as your Savior, is to make the decision I'm going to not just believe that God exists and not just go to church and kind of go through the motions, but I want to have this relationship with a Savior. I want to actually trust Jesus, to say, Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness of my sins. Come into my life. Cleanse me. I'm repenting to you. Take my sins away. Wash me white as snow because Jesus died for our sins. He did what nobody else could do. He died and rose again to pay the penalty for our sins. When you've trusted in that and you've accepted that into your life, then the Holy Spirit fills you. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. All right, we're all on the same page? We good? We're going to start in Acts just like we started last week. Uh, Acts chapter 1, I'm going to kind of move around just like I did last week. This is a topical message, um, so not really telling a story and kind of sticking with that story like I do sometimes. Um, this series is a little more topical. That's just kind of the way that it works for this one to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, here's what's going on. Jesus has died. He's rose again. He's about to go back up into heaven, right? And this is just before he, he's having kind of his last minute, you know, hoorah, like pep rally with the disciples, right? He's got his, his core gathered around him, and he's saying to them, okay, I'm about to go, but somebody's coming, that, that Holy Spirit. And then Jesus 
ascends into heaven. All right. So this is what he says in Acts chapter 1. We're going to read verses 4 and 5 and then verse 8. They'll be on the screen if you don't have your copy of God's Word. It's also in your worship guide. It says this, Once when he, that's, that's Jesus, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God. When you trust Jesus as your Savior, you receive the gift of salvation, and you also get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John, that's John the Baptist, all right? This is the cousin of Jesus. Jesus says, John baptized with water. They were all familiar with that. They had been to the river. They had seen, like, they were, some of them were there that day when John's, like, preaching about the one is coming whose sandals I'm not fit to tie. And, he, and you know, you got to believe in him. He's the Messiah. He's going to set us free from our sins. And John, just kind of this crazy prophet preacher, he's out in the wilderness, and the whole city's coming out to listen because they've never heard or seen anything like this. And John's dunking people under water and baptizing them with water. And some of them were there that day that Jesus showed up, and John sees Jesus from a distance, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right, that's the John that Jesus is talking about. He says, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. You will receive power. Now, that he's talking directly to his core of disciples, but this is also a promise for us for all of us, because every believer, as we continue reading in the New Testament, and we talked about it last week, every believer receives the Holy Spirit and receives the same power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Listen, we are here today because what Jesus said would happen, happened. We're here today because the disciples received the presence and the power, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as you continue reading Acts, we're not going to go there, but you know, you roll into Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit shows up. Listen, the Holy Spirit had already been there, all right? They had already been filled with the Holy Spirit, but he had not made himself known. It was like that light was clicked off, that, that spiritual sixth sense was not turned on yet. The Spirit was there filling them because the Spirit was there from the beginning. Every believer in the Old Testament was filled with the same Spirit that we're filled with. But God had not turned that on yet. And when he turned it on, Acts chapter 2 teaches us that it was like flames of fire, like tongues of fire over their heads. It was almost like this light bulb moment, like, you know, you've seen cartoons, except instead of the light bulb coming on, it was a raging inferno, all right, when the Holy Spirit showed up. And they began to, to heal people and speak in tongues and in languages that, that they did not know, and people heard them preach. And in that very first day, 3,000 people were added to the church. But here's what I want you to understand about the disciples. Sometimes we, we read Acts and we hear about the power of the Holy Spirit and what happened at, on that day that we call Pentecost in the church. And we think, well, that was the disciples, right? That was 2,000 years ago. They got to spend time with Jesus. I'm nothing like them. I don't, I don't understand the Bible the way that the disciples understood the Bible. I don't even understand the Bible the way that the pastor understands the Bible or somebody who's been to seminary and learned Greek and Hebrew, which I have not done that. Everything I learn, I read from somebody else or I talk to somebody like my dad who does understand the language and I ask them questions. I learn just like you learn. I sit and I listen, just like sometimes you sit and listen. But we will compare ourselves to the disciples and say, I'm not as strong a Christian as they are. Listen. For three and a half years, Jesus walked with the disciples. And I'm, go back and read the Gospels. If you haven't read your Bible, go back and read the Gospels. Every time he performed a miracle and he taught them a lesson, they didn't get it. And literally, like you can read in the Gospels, multiple accounts where Jesus turns to them, and it's almost like he just slaps them upside the head. And he was like, dummies, don't y'all get it yet? I mean, he'll say to the disciples, don't you yet under, have you not spent time with me? Don't you understand yet? Listen, the disciples were dumb. Like, we, we think they were really smart, but they were right there with Jesus, and they didn't get it. And when Jesus died on the cross before he rose from the dead, what were they doing on that first Easter Sunday morning when he rose? They were hiding. They were afraid that, the, that, that all, all of the, you know, the, the Roman army and, the, and, the, and maybe the, the temple guard were going to come arrest them because their Messiah, the one that they thought was going like, to rule as a king forever over Israel, was dead and they were scared and afraid, and they were hiding 
in a room. And some ladies, ladies, thank you for leading. Men, you bunch of cowards. Some ladies, they went to the tomb to, to go, you know, take care of the body of Jesus, and they're the first ones who experience the risen Lord. And they run back, and they tell the, the rest of the men in the room who are hiding, you'll never believe it. Jesus is risen. The tomb is empty. And they don't believe the women. They can't, you know, like, you're, you're dumber than we are, right? I mean, like, and so they run, and they can't believe it, and then they experience it. And then they've seen Jesus for like 40 days. Hundreds of people have experienced the risen Savior. And he just tells them in Acts chapter 1, I'm going, but it's good for you that I go because I'm gonna, you know, God's going to send the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive power. Stay here in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere until you receive that power. Guess where they are in Acts chapter 2? Back in the room hiding again. They're not out in the street corner. They're, they're not out preaching when the Holy Spirit shows up. They're not these superhuman disciples that sometimes we think that they are until they experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you've ever said or thought about yourself, I just, I just don't have what Pastor Chris has, or I just don't have what Peter had. Or, I mean, I, I ain't got anything on Peter like, or Paul or anybody else. Like, I, I'm not going to compare myself to them at all. But if you've ever compared yourself to a preacher, a disciple, a missionary who like, puts it all on the line for Jesus and thought, I just don't have what they have. Yeah, you do. You just haven't experienced it yet. And he's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. It is that power that filled the disciples, that empowered them, that took them from a bunch of chickens in a room to guys who would stand in front of those guards and who would stand in front, like on trial, risking their lives and would say, listen, I know you're about to kill me, but that's okay. You can go ahead and kill me because I know my risen Lord and Savior. And I can see him in the throne room right now. They, I don't know how that worked, but again, that sixth sense is going on. They've been open to the Spirit. And there, you know, you can, again, read it in the New Testament. I can see the throne room of God. And I'm about to go there, so you need to hear about Jesus and let me share him with you. Right? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. What if, what if, we as a church tapped into that. What if you as an individual, for your family, for your business, for our church, for our community, our neighbors in the next generation, what if we tapped into that same power? So there's four things I want to share with you this morning about power. But real quickly, let's, let's take a look at that word power. Everybody say power. 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 Here's the, the, the Greek word for power is dunamis or dunamis. I've got it up on the screen. It's the word that we get dynamite from, right? You've all heard of dynamite, TNT, right? It's, it's that same word that's used to describe the power of the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 1. And it's that same word throughout the New Testament that's, that's describing the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like dynamite in your life. Listen, when you lean into the Holy Spirit, he might just blow up your life. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean in a good way. Things may change. If you... If your finances are struggling so badly that you just want to, I don't mean like literally blow something up, like blow up the bank. Like that's, I'm not talking about that. But like if, if you just wish somebody would blow up your debt, you know what I mean? Like just crush it. Listen, I'm not saying that because you're a Jesus follower, all of a sudden magically your debt goes away. But when you start living in the power of the Holy Spirit and walking with God, it goes away. Because you learn to live the way that God wants you to live. In your family, in your, in your relationship, in your marriage, again... I'm not telling you to hire somebody to knock off your husband, ladies, or your wives. Right? That's not what I mean. But if sometimes you just wish that something would change, something dynamic, that, that it just needs to blow up and like be put back together again, that's the power of the Holy Spirit for all of us. This word dunamis, it means a force, a miraculous power, the explosive power of God. That's what we're going to talk about. So here's four things. Number one. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to share Christ boldly. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to share Christ boldly. Of course, I'm going to start here. All right? This is where the disciples started at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. This is where, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, this is where they started. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to share Christ boldly. I know a lot of us would say, I really don't, I, I don't, I don't have that. I don't have what they have. Yes, you do. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5 says this. 
And my message and my preaching were very plain. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. He's like, look, guys, when I first spoke to you, when you heard me preach, my, my speaking was very plain. I kept it simple. Paul was a very smart guy, but he kept it simple. It was plain. Rather than using clearful, cl- I'm sorry, clever and persuasive speeches, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Here's Paul, wrote most of the New Testament. Like, what he's saying is, listen, it's not me. What you're reading in Scripture are not my words. I mean, yes, it may be me writing it down, or it may have been a, you know, somebody writing what Paul was dictating. It may have come out of his mouth. But what he's saying is, listen, this is the power of the Holy Spirit. What, what you have experienced, the gospel that you've heard, the messages that you've heard that have been life-changing, it's not me, and it's not me. Paul says it's not me. Pastor Chris is saying it's not me. If there's ever been any life change in your life as a result of any message you've ever heard any pastor, preacher, missionary preach, it's not them. It's the power of the Holy Spirit working through them. Let me give you a real life example. So my son's playing football. And uh, he's got one game left. You know, he loves playing football. He's homeschooled, by the way. We homeschooled our four kids, started a couple of years ago. And he's aged out of, of local sports outside of schools because as a homeschooler, you can't yet in Mississippi play you know, in public school teams. So we've always relied, you know, on city leagues, and it's a whole lot of fun, you know. But he's aged out of the city league. So there's a homeschool group in Memphis. It's called the Memphis Nighthawks. And uh, it's like, you can live anywhere in the Memphis area. If you can get to practice, you can be on the team. Like, that's the way it works. So, you know, there's like three families that we car, us and two other families that we carpool with um, from here up to Memphis, like four days a week. It's like a 45, like that's some commitment, right? He loves playing football. Well, one of the families that we carpool with, I did not know this. I recognize the name, and, and I thought mom kind of looked familiar. She's the one who usually does the carpooling. Um, but then I saw dad. And I was like, I know that guy. I went to school with him. And at the very, first fo- the very first high school football game, my son's on the middle school team, the very first high school football game we were at, and uh, I walked up and I said, man, I remember you. Let me introduce myself. I'm Grace. He's like, I, I remember. I know-, I know exactly who you are. You're Chris Sykes. You're Larry's son. <laughs> they- yeah. <laughs> exactly. They, li- they live down in Eudora. Obviously, they go to another church. Um, but he said, yeah, I-, I don't know if you'll remember this or not. But in high school, we went to high school together at Horn Lake High School. So I don't know if you'll remember this or not, but in high school, you and another guy prayed for me and for my dad who had cancer. And when he told me that, I'm like, because we weren't like best friends. I mean, this was a guy that I, I'd seen in the hallways and obviously talked to once or twice, but by no means were we friends in high school. But you know, when he started telling me that, I remember just vaguely, I think we were standing in the library, the old library at Horn Lake High School, and, and I remember the other guy that, you know, the three of us, we prayed together, and we prayed for him. And he said, man, that was so awesome, because at the time, I was not a believer. And the way that you and the other guy prayed, the, like, just the words that came out of your mouth, I'd never heard somebody pray that way, and like, and like it just seemed like the power of the Holy Spirit was there. And I was not a believer then. But that moment sort of sparked in him an interest. I mean, he believed in God, and he'd gone to church and that sort of thing. I mean, you know, we live in the South, like, right? Everybody goes to church at some point. But in that moment, for him, that sort of sparked this journey that it wasn't too many months after that that he trusted Jesus as his Savior. And now he and his wife lead the student ministry at their church, and they've done it for years. Listen, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I don't remember what I said or prayed. I probably didn't remember what I said or prayed like five minutes after it happened, if I'm, if I'm really honest. But what I know is that in that moment, because I was simply willing, because somebody came to me and said, hey, would you pray for me? And in the moment, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, willingly, I said, sure, and I prayed for somebody in high school. I did not cause him to get saved. I am not responsible for him being a a student minister, a youth minister at his church. I'm not responsible for that. The Holy Spirit is, but I got to be a part of it. And what happens for you, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that the Holy Spirit gives you to share Christ boldly at work, at school, in your families, when you open yourself up and you say, you know what, I don't know what this is going to sound like, what it's going to look like, 
But Holy Spirit, you just speak through me, and I'm going to do what you want me to do. When you open yourself up to that, you will experience the power of the Holy Spirit in ways that you may not even know about for 20 years. Because that was like back in 1994, 95 when that happened. Yes, I'm that old. I know I don't look it. I have a beautiful young wife who keeps me young, right? You know, that, so I don't look it, right? But anyway, you may not know it for years, but the power's there. That's number one. Number two, the Holy Spirit gives you the power when you are weak. When you are weak. Romans 8.26 says this in the NIV. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know, we do not know what we ought to pray for. Hmm. I don't, have you ever thought about that before? We do not know what we ought to pray for. We as humans are so limited. We, our brains are so finite. We don't even really know how to pray. And, and, and right here in Romans, Paul's saying, like, listen, I'm just going to own up to it. I'm going to fess up to it. Because like, Paul is including him. He's saying we. We, right? We, we don't really know what to pray for. And we pray for stuff. And I'm not telling you, not, it's not like one of those things you don't know. You don't know what to pray for, so you shouldn't pray. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying... Listen, we really, like if we really knew what to pray, we would probably pray differently. But because we don't really even know what to pray for, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. That wherever you are in life, wherever you are in life, whatever you're experiencing, whatever it is that you are going through that, is, that has caused you to be weak, in your weakness, what the Holy Spirit does is, he prays on your behalf because he knows what's best for you even when you don't know what's best for you. He knows what you need for healing and to make you stronger even when you don't know what you need for healing and to make you stronger. And the Holy Spirit asks God for it on your behalf because, frankly, we're all too dumb to ask for the right thing anyway. <laughs> I mean, if we're just honest. But the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, again, it's one of those things you open yourself up and you say, okay, God, I'm not even sure how to pray, so I'm going to pray. But whatever your will is, God, you do it. Whatever your will is, God, send your Holy Spirit to work this way. 2 Corinthians 12 says this. This is Paul again writing, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Each time he said, now let me back up a minute. Paul has, has, has had an issue. We don't know what the issue is, right? There's something that's been, he called it the thorn in his flesh. There's something going on. It may have been physical, it may have been spiritual. We don't know if it was a temptation. A lot of us think it may have been something physical, like maybe he had you know, some kind of a disease or a stomach ailment, or maybe he was going blind. We don't know, but there was something physical or spiritual going on with Paul, and he was asking God to take it away. Right? God, would you take this away? And he's, right before this, he says three times, three times I poured my heart out to God and I asked God, like, God, please take this out of my life. Whatever this is that Paul's suffering with, and then it says, each time he, that's God, each time God said, my grace is all you need. My power, my dynamite, my dunamis, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad, this is Paul again, so now I, Paul, am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ, that's the power of the Holy Spirit, can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I mean, how many times did Paul go to prison? And like, or how many, how many days, months, years did he spend in prison where he's writing letters just like this, saying, listen, don't worry about my circumstances because I'm strong. I'm not the weak one. I may be in chains, but they're chained to me. My problems, my captors, they're chained to me and to the gospel. they got to listen to me. When I am weak... I am my strongest. And listen, I don't know what you're chained to this morning. I don't know what's going on in your, in your life, what physical ailments, what spiritual battles, what temptations, addictions that you're struggling with. Maybe there's somebody in your family that you've been praying for and you've been trusting God. God, please just take the, take the sickness away. Take whatever it is away and heal them. I don't know what God's will is in your circumstance, but here's what I know. When you trust Jesus and you trust the power of the Holy Spirit, when you are your weakest, you're your strongest. Because what you're doing is you're allowing your king, your warrior, who wants to fight for you, to fight for you. And you will always win that battle. You will always win that battle. 
when you ask the Holy Spirit and you submit to his authority and his power in your life. Some of you, you're here this morning just to hear that and just to begin thinking about what would it look like in my life if I just gave this area of my life to the Holy Spirit. You come to church, you sit here every week and you listen to me. You know, you're, you're in and out constantly, and, and you may even be in the Word of God. You may, you may even be religiously reading and journaling and writing things down. But are you submitting your whole life to the power of the Holy Spirit, even where you feel weak, instead of trying to hold on to it and get through it on your own? Because how far has that gotten you? Trying to get through it on your own. We give that to the Holy Spirit. He gives us power. I've got another friend. I served on staff with him at Pine Lake. His name is Darren Miley. He's a pastor there. He's one of our counselors. Darren's got a couple of kids, one son in particular. Um, his son, Harrison, college age, he was actually one of the small group leaders for my son. He, he and his, his wife, it was his girlfriend then, wife now, um, were, were some of the small group leaders that worked with my son, Grayson. The whole time we were at Pine Lake, Harrison was struggling with cancer. And it was amazing to watch this family because Harrison, I mean, like literally they did surgeries and I don't understand all of this. I don't know how it works, but he had issues in, well, like cancer in his legs and I don't know where, where else it was, but I don't even know what kind of cancer it was. So all the details, but some of the amazing details that I heard, like the doctors went in and removed bones and regrew new bones. Like, I don't even know how that works, but as they removed parts of the cancer, the whole, like... And they, and they injected stuff into his bones to kill and fight the cancer. And they, it was just amazing to hear how he was in pain and struggled day in and day out. But I'm going to tell you, like, he would have one of those surgeries where all I, like, I don't know how it goes, but in my mind, it's like, it's, it's like a cyborg robot, you know, like a RoboCop moment where, like, he's completely apart on a table and they put him back together. And like the next week, he'd be back at church with crutches, leading a small group, with a smile on his face. How is that possible? He was full of the Holy Spirit. And then about two weeks ago, Harrison lost his battle with cancer. And a father invited a huge church thousands of friends to show up for an afternoon picnic costume party to celebrate the life of his son who loved to karaoke and streamed it live on Facebook for 7,500 more people to watch. How does that pastor, that father, stand there and talk about his fallen son and still serve week after week faithfully and love his family and his wife and not just go crazy. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when you are your weakest, God is never weak. The Holy Spirit is never weak. If you've never experienced something like that before, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Even for people who aren't believers, that somebody dies in their family or they go through cancer and they, they somehow get through that. Listen, I'm just telling you, it's the grace of God surrounding them that keeps them together. Without a doubt. They don't even realize that he's loving them and comforting them. But imagine how much sweeter it is when you have a relationship with Jesus, when you have a relationship with God, and you open yourself up to it. And you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the power of the Holy Spirit is working in your life and in your family's life. Number three, the Holy Spirit gives you the power to have hope in a hopeless world. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever lost hope? If you've ever lost hope, it's because you weren't tied into the power of the Holy Spirit. For every believer, for every believer, God wants to give you hope in a hopeless world. 
When you feel like you're, you're at, the end of your, at the end of your rope in your marriage, when you feel like you're at the end of your rope in your job, and you want out, but you don't see a way out, right? And, and you, you want your marriage to be healed, but you don't see how that marriage can possibly be salvaged and be saved and be healed. When you're at the end and it seems like you're hopeless, when you've got a child who you know, has just like run off and gone crazy, right? Or, or some other family member that you care about, and they're, they're involved in something that, that you wish you could drag them back from, and it just seems like a hopeless situation, the only hope that you may have is hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when it seems hopeless, listen, I'm not saying that trusting in Jesus is automatically going to change all of those circumstances. That's not what I'm implying. But when you're in the middle of that circumstance and you open yourself up to the power of the Holy Spirit, what this verse says and what it is very clearly telling us is that where other people would seem like they're going crazy, going nuts, when you would be yelling at the ceiling, at the walls, at the floor, at your husband, at your wife, when you would be at your wits end and just want to ball up your fists or pick up a baseball bat and just bash something in, been there, felt that way. May have done it a time or two, if I'm honest. When you're walking in the Spirit, He brings peace. And I don't know if you've ever met somebody, like, like if you've just met somebody who it just seems like, I mean, you know they're a Christian, but it's like nothing ruffles their feathers. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, some of us kind of just have that personality where we go with the flow, like Nathan, our worship leader, I, I'm amazed at how he just sort of goes with the flow, you know. And it's it, it's an amazing quality that he has as, as part of his personality. But part of that is the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, because I know that he's opened himself up to that. And if you ever looked at somebody who just sort of has that personality trait, and you wish that you were a little bit more like them, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, all the way. You can be that person in that time when it just seems like everything is blowing up. The power of the Holy Spirit brings peace and brings hope in a hopeless world. And finally, number four, the Holy Spirit gives you the power to experience all the fullness of God. This is that one where you're probably scratching your head going like, okay, I get the share Christ, you know, I can maybe share the gospel. I've been weak, sometimes I've been hopeless, but what what do you mean experience the fullness of God? Does that mean I've got to come to church more, (laughs) right? Is Is that what we're talking about here? No. So here again, Paul to the Ephesians, he writes this. This is Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he, that's God, he, will empower you, that's like stir up the Holy Spirit inside of you, that God will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand. You remember how I said, like, we're just sometimes too dumb to get it? Paul's like, yeah, we are, but God can give you the power to understand. All right? I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will give you the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Like none of us will ever completely get, because we're not Jesus ourselves, we cannot die and come back to life to save somebody from their sins. But Paul says, even though you can't understand it fully, I'm praying that you understand it fully, that you experience it fully. The love of Jesus, this is my prayer for you. And then, then, this is what we're all leading up to, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest, have it more abundantly. And Paul says, listen, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you will plant yourself in Jesus, in his love, in what he did for you, that you will trust in the gospel, that you'll trust that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again. But it's more than just like staying, like like I want you to be so rooted that as your roots grow down into Jesus and you get closer and closer to him, that the power of the Holy Spirit so fills your life that you will finally be complete and full exactly the way that Christ intended you to be. If in your life this morning you feel incomplete, 
It's because you have not experienced and opened yourself up to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's because you have not rooted yourself in the power that comes from a relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know many of you are believers. You've trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've been baptized. You know where your eternal home is in glory. You know that you're going to heaven someday. You know that if Jesus came back right now, like your clothes would still be sitting there, but you would be gone. Maybe you take your clothes with you. I don't know. But you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that you are saved, but you still live your life day in, day out, day after day after day after day, wondering, isn't there something more? What is it that I'm missing? What I'm telling you this morning is that you're missing the Holy Spirit. You are not opening your life up. You are not plugging yourself in. You are not looking for the Holy Spirit. I had the opportunity a couple of days ago, to me and my dad did, to pray with a family about some spiritual issues. And I'm going to say to you what I said to them. Have you ever, like, bought a new car, right? And, and all of a sudden, like, let's say you buy a new Toyota Camry. And then it seems like everywhere you go, everybody's driving a Camry, right? Like, you know, you get this new car, and then it seems like everybody else has that car, too. I mean, I hope that you've experienced that at least one time in your life, right? It's this phenomenon where the familiar, all of a sudden, we just start seeing everywhere. Here's how we've been living our lives. We've been living our lives focused on our lives, We've been living our lives focused on I gotta get up, I gotta get ready, I gotta go to work, I gotta get the kids to school, I gotta make a paycheck, I gotta come home, I gotta pay for the cable and pay for the light bill and pay for the phone bill and pay for the internet and watch some Netflix and and we're focused on what we call life. And when we're focused on life, not necessarily bad things, right? But also not things of heaven. When all we're focused on is this this life, what we will see everywhere we go is this life. Let me describe this life to you. Divorce, decay, death, cancer, work, bills that go unpaid. That's what we begin to focus on. And what Paul is saying, what Jesus tells us, what we read in other places in the New Testament is to focus on the things of heaven, focus on the things of God. When you in your life, when you you just decide, I'm going to flip the switch, And I'm going to stop focusing just on me and just on the things in my life. But instead, I'm going to begin focusing on the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start looking for what we would call the supernatural. God would call the natural. I'm going to start looking for where God is working in my life. And I'm going to start moving in that direction. You know what happens? It's like buying a new car. All of a sudden, you start seeing and experiencing the Holy Spirit everywhere. You start understanding your life in a totally different way. God, why am I working here? I hate this job. And then you meet somebody who needs to hear the gospel, and you go, oh, Holy Spirit, I get it. This is the most awesome job I've ever had. Even though I'm not good in it, in my weakness, I'm strong, and you've given me the boldness to share the gospel with this person. Now I know why I'm here. Now I've got purpose. God, I don't understand why this person is struggling, why why they're dealing with this sickness. Oh, now I get it. God, now I get it because you've put me in their life. I get to pray with them. I'm going to lay hands on them. You are going to use me to comfort their family. God, thank you. In my weakness, I am strong. When you open yourself up to the power of Holy Spirit, you will experience the Holy Spirit in a way that you've never felt possible. And you know what Paul called that and what Jesus called that? A full and complete life. What you think is natural today is unnatural. It's less than natural. The power of the Holy Spirit experienced in your life, that is the fullness of nature. It is the way God intended us to be. We are either unaware or we're ignoring it. God wants you to be complete.